So, yeah, let's finish today with something totally different. Let's talk about hominids. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about virtual reconstruction we recently published, um, as well as the volumetric mass estimation. Um, first thing to say, it came out a couple of weeks ago. We're very pleased because it means we've got a couple of presentations coming out. I can say to anyone who has really detailed questions, read the paper. Um, so, hominids, there's a lot. This is just a small sample of the cranial remains from hominids. Most of the early stuff, that I've got hardly any of the Chinese sample from later on, and I've only got like two or three Neanderthals, we've got about 40 or 50, and then as the uh, Pleistocene, towards the end of the Pleistocene, population went up again, and then Holocene, it's gone up and up and up and up with crashes here and there to the point that we've got over six billion humans today. So, you know, looking at hominids, working out where we come from is uh, of considerable public interest as well as scientific interest. So why did we choose to do a reconstruction of Lucy? First thing, she's an iconic fossil. Most people, most members of the public, when you say, uh, when you mention the name Lucy the fossil, have some idea, um, and it's very quick to engage people. Um, it's a good hook. Um, it's relatively complete uh, for a Pliocene hominid. About 40% of the skeleton is, is um, in existence, including most of the major parts. Uh, you know, most limbs will have at least a bit. Um, we're interested in our group in biomechanics and how locomotion, how things move. So we um, like to run simulations on locomotion, so we need a model to put into our software to run. So um, that's another consideration. But as part of those simulations, we need to know how much she weighs. So uh, one of the methods, which is Charlotte mentioned earlier, um, is very popular in our group currently, is the convex hull um, body mass estimation, which I'll cover later on in the talk. Um, also, uh, an area of debate uh, um, in paleoanthropology is the evolution of, mon of human obstetrics. Uh, this is an interesting one because most of the um, authors that written on it until quite recently have been white and male. <laughs> So um, luckily there's a newer generation of um, slightly more representative sample of people working on this. But we were quite, you know, we're, we're, we've got to reconstruct the pelvis, so we will talk about obstetric considerations at some point. What are the problems? As I said, it's fairly complete, but it's only 40% complete. Many of the bones are fairly fragmentary. If you go back, you see, you know, you've only got the top, you're mi missing the middle of the tibia, you're missing most of your fibula, radius and ulna are sort of a bit mixed. This um, humerus here was a bit smushed up. That's all you've got of the scapula. This um, cast here is actually missing the clavicle. We've only got the middle third of the clavicle, missing about half of the vertebral column. We've only got about half of the uh, rib cage. Um, so what, are, what solutions did we decide on? We, fill, uh, we decided to fill in these gaps using a combination of conventional scaling models, either virtually or physically sculpting models, and then more advanced uh, virtual models using mirroring, bog standard morphometrics, and then uh, more uh, sophisticated geometric morphometrics. So with our more traditional reconstruction, with a vertebral column, we estimated the height using modern humans, small body modern humans, as a reference standard. We also um, ran regression, seeing what the height would be if we used proportion from chimpanzees, gorillas, taller modern humans, males, females, mixed samples. Um, and we found that the most satisfactory uh, answer was using small bodied modern humans um, from the Andaman Islands, because we've got the data. Um, it seemed to fit much more with the proportions of what existed in Lucy. Uh, then when we had that, what we would call a dry height for the vertebral column, you've got to adjust for the intervertebral bit discs. So luckily there's 
uh, uh, good literature from clinical papers uh, on intervertebral disc height in modern humans. So we adjusted our um, height for that uh, with the limbs. Uh, these were the, the humerus, um, the humerus had actually been reconstructed by um, Kappelman's team from micro CT. So that's available publicly. So we were able to just download that scan, bish bash bosh, just mirror it, it'd be fine. Um, the radius, ulna, and ulna, and fibula, uh, my supervisor Andrew Chamberlain a few years ago um, actually made sculpt reconstructions of these uh, using modern reference regression combined with. Um, what we know about afferensis body proportions to um, come up with a reasonable length for them. Uh, the uh, femurs, we just virtually reconstructed. The tibia, because we knew how long the fibula was probably going to be, we just articulated, we just uh, suspended those parts. The foot is actually another of Andrew's, another Andrew Chamberlain special. That is a reconstruction he did several years ago of the famous OH8 foot. Um, and we just had a scan of that and we scaled that to fit with the um, talus existing from Lucy. The hands, <coughs> very boring. That's a modern clinical CT scan. We again scaled to the size of the existing hand bone. Clavicle. Australopithecus sediba from South Africa has a complete clavicle. So we just took the scan of that and scaled it to the size of the fragment Lucy. It actually came out with, uh, our reviewers complained about this. Some tried to measure a 3D, uh, an oblique view of a 3D scan. They tried to do a 2D measurement from an illustration and said, oh, that's no way near the length. We went back and said, yes, it is. That's why you don't do a, 2D, a measurement of a picture of a 3D scan. Um, <laughs> cautionary tale. Um, it's, it fitted perfectly with all the regressions that we'd been suggested in review and, in fact, we'd use ourselves. Uh, the cranium, this was a scaled, uh, but rather than morphing in all the fragments from Lucy's thing, we just used a uh, composite uh, cast, which is known as the AL330 composite, we scaled that to the fragments that exist for Lucy. So that's all fairly straightforward, um, not too in work intensive reconstruction. Now for the fun, shiny stuff. So it's the virtual reconstruction of the pelvis. I'm just going to click a button. Many of you have seen the pelvis, in a, a 3D print of the pelvis in real life. This is what it looks like from all angles as computer. This is rigged for 3D printing. Um, so what we did, we took it with A, we took the sacrum, cut it in half virtually, and mirrored it. Um, then from the sacrum, we had a central line. We uh, l did a lich search to work out how um, thick the cartilage here usually is. Um, we came up with a figure of around six millimeters because of the size of Lucy. Um, so this, these second lines are about six millimeters, uh, about three millimeters uh, either side of the um, central line. We articulated um, and we used the point there and we just mirrored the pelvis. What this does is it makes it deeper than previous reconstructions. What we found, uh, what, looking back at the literature over time, every time someone reconstructs an australopith pelvis, it gets deeper. It gets more modern human-like. So this, though, in Lovejoy's classic one, you'll see this in textbooks where it's really flat and you have the expression platypaloid. It's nonsense. Hoisler's e expression, sorry. <laughs> Hoisler's uh, reconstruction is a bit more realistic. I've had a look at the original reconstruction. I have 3D print. Um, I disagree with Martin on certain aspects, but that's life. And then ours, it's a bit deeper. It's probably wrong, but the micro CT data was, uh, cat was ga uh, they gathered the micro CT data over 10 years ago, and since then there's been two papers. Um, none, of the papers uh, none of the data is publicly available until that is um, either published more fully or made available to more researchers, uh, we're only going to be on working hypotheses because 
the area that articulates with the sacrum in 2881 is crushed. So we're try we've left a gap because we know it's not a perfect articulation. Also, good idea of scale, <coughs> as Alessandro, Alessandro from last night makes quite a nice hat. So this is Lucy. Um, before, when you had the very flat uh, reconstruction, Lucy really stuck out among hominids. Now she doesn't. She just looks like the rest. So we've got Chimp here, we've got Ardipithecus, Lucy, and we've got other um, Australopithecines. Then we have Homo erectus, Neanderthals, modern humans. It's all a fairly continuous sequence now, which is nice. Scapula. Again, we use, we're, now we're moving to geometric morphometrics. We used uh, thin plate spine um, regression to uh, estimate the rest of the scapula. This looks a bit rough and ready. We 3D printed the scapula. It articulates perfectly with the humerus. So we're quite happy with it. This is what we like have when we do a bit of mirroring of the rib cage. We should actually have a quite good amount. You can start to see what the rib cage probably looks like. So what we did was each rib, uh, we virtually articulated each of the rib fragments. And then for each rib, we did a geometric morphometric reconstruction. So it, this was four sets of 61 landmark, semi-landmarks from uh, just past the angle. And then we had three or four around the angle and three or four around the head. Uh, the reason why it's such a dense sampling is because when you've got um, you know, fragmentary ribs like that. Some of them you've got 50, 60% of a rib, some you've got 20, 30%. The more landmarks you have there, the more landmarks you have here, a bit more of a hook for the regressions to catch on to, essentially. We have tried it with lower numbers of landmarks and other groups have, and we found that with more fragmentary material, you need a denser sampling to give yourself a chance. This is what her thorax now looks like. This is what the conventional Peter Schmidt um, or um, Lovejoy reconstruction of the thorax was. So they had it very funnel shaped, a bit more like a chimpanzee. New reconstructions of uh, another um, afarensis individual who's known as Kadanumu from uh, the Afar as well. Kadanumu means big man. He's about 50 centimeters taller than Lucy. Um, has it a lot more like a modern human shape. They call it bell shape. Our Lucy one is slightly more barrel shaped, but it's approaching bell shape. I think this is probably to do with um, size, and it's something we're going to start looking into, hopefully in the future, or we'll get a student to look at. Final product, very shiny, and that's what it looks like. We'll have a quick spin. She's one of the tallest Lucy reconstructions to date, so she's at 1 meter 11. Some reconstructions have her about 1 meter 4 or 5. This is all available. This model that's showing there's some gaps, that's the model you can go and download from Figshare right now if you want. You can 3D print it. Some of the stuff works better than others as 3D prints. Convex hulling, body mass estimation. Works like a virtual shrink wrap on your model. We use the model and compare it to a regression from known body mass skeletons or cadavers uh, that we've scanned or we've obtained scans of uh, that have, we've then run a convex hull on. In our case, it reduced the weight to around 20 kilos. There's a typo in the abstract, it said 20.1. Uh, our preferred weight ended up as 20.4 kilos. Uh, most previous estimates were much closer to the 25 kilo weight ground. Right, so problems. Is it the wrong calibration date to set? Not, I mean, it'd be nice to have more primates. We only had 15 in calibration data set. It's unlike, but we covered a wide range of size and genera within primates, so we think that's unlikely. People got more cadavers they want to give to us to see if the equation holds up. That's fine, we're more than happy to open that. Is it too short or too tall? Unlikely, there's a bit of, we've used the very latest data on what's known about afarensis and also body proportions within uh, hominoids generally. Error in rib placement, probably. No model's going to be perfect, and rib placement in fossil reconstructions is very difficult. And where the, as uh, my colleague Rob was saying earlier about you know, where ribs are during breathing, 
uh, full inhalation versus full exhalation, the position of ribs are going to be slightly difficult, different. So this is very probably wrong in some respects, but only minorly. Is there a different mass distribution in afarensis? Doubt it. She's a hominoid. She's probably going to fit in. Right, so very, very quickly, future work. Bill's going to put it into gate sim, of course. So we're going to have locomotion simulations. Then this next one I'd ask no one tweets about because this is very early. We are doing in silico birth simulations. And obviously, as I also work for 3D printing, we'll do it with 3D prints to see how effective it is in the future. So sorry I've run over slightly. Here's some thanks to all the various grants, people, companies that have helped us along the way. And thank you. <laughs>